Every single person, at least in our culture, has an image of Jesus. They have some way that they perceive him. For some people, uh, Jesus is very popular, while for others, he's very polarizing, just dependent upon the life that they're living. To some people, Jesus is like a political pundit, like, like it, it, loving Jesus requires you to be Republican who watches Fox News all day and has an NRA sticker on the back of their pickup truck. And to other people, Jesus is like a pop icon. I mean, he is a movie star. He's in the theater right now. He has his own line of t-shirts, one that says, like, Jesus is my homeboy. And the one you saw me wear last week with the glasses look like Terminator where Jesus said, I'll be back. And uh, I mean, the guy's made a guest appearance on South Park. Not very many people have been able to claim that in life. So, so Jesus is becoming a pretty big deal now. He's catching on. He's starting to take a snowball that's starting to pick up steam. But, but all of that brings up the question, who is Jesus? And that's what this series has been about. It, it's not been about what other people's perceptions are of Jesus. It's about who Jesus really is. It's about what this book says about him and historically who he's proven to be. And, and over the last number of weeks, we've shared different perspectives, different characteristics. Jesus, the friend and the teacher, the miracle worker. Jesus, the shepherd. Last week, we talked about Jesus is coming again. And if you've missed any of the messages in this series, you can go on our website, lifechurchgreenbay.com. You can watch them or you can listen to them on our podcast. And this whole series really has had one theme verse, and it comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. It's from the message version of the Bible. It says, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you to let you in on God's master stroke, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First Jesus and who he is, then Jesus and what he did. Jesus crucified. You know, for me... I believe that it doesn't really matter what Jesus did until you learn who Jesus is. Because if Jesus isn't who we claim him to be, then it doesn't really matter what we claim that he did. And so today, we're going to do the next to last week of this series, Who is Jesus, with the message, Jesus is God. Let's pray. God, we love you. We thank you. I thank you for all of the things that you've done for me, the countless things that you have done, things that you have provided, things that you have healed, things that you have smoothed over, things that you have helped me to avoid. But God, uh, above and beyond all of the things that you've done, I want to thank you for all of the things that you've been to me and that you are to me. My friend that sticks closer than a brother, the person that will never leave me, that will never forsake me, my coach, my confidant, my counselor, my God. God, I pray today that the words will come off of the page and deposit themselves into our heart so that we'll be changed, so that when we leave here, as we learn about Jesus, we'll become more like him. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus is God. I think when you look through the, all the, the list of things that we could have talked about, the different characteristics that we could have talked about, maybe it's a, a bit of a mystery why we would why we would talk about this one. I mean, Jesus is God. Doesn't that just seem a bit obvious? Isn't that why we get up and we come to this place and why we have this book? And I mean, it just seems normative that, that Jesus would be God. I mean, we all know that he's God. It's completely obvious. It's obvious to us, Jesus people, church people, God people. It's completely obvious. But to people who aren't Jesus people, people in our culture, people that we rub elbows with, Every day. This is not obvious. We live in a culture that has a real problem with the thought of Jesus as God. If you want to think about Jesus as a good man, fine. Is he, was he a good teacher? Absolutely. Was he a prophet? I think so. Was he a world changer? Well, there's no way to deny it because our entire calendar system is predicated upon him. Obviously, this person changed the world. But Jesus as God, G-O-D, the capital G. Like, that's where the rub begins with people. And the reason for that is because we live in an incredibly tolerant society. We, 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 want, we want people to believe whatever they want. In our culture, we would say, you know, you can believe what you want, but don't you dare try to, try to push your beliefs on me. Beliefs are very personal. 
fact, this week I was driving down the street and I took a picture of a bumper sticker that I saw on a car. And I, I, I'll have it put up on the screen. I want you to see this. If Maybe you have a hard time reading that. This is what it says. <clears throat> if you respect my religion, I will respect yours. I will respect yours. We live in a culture where there is zero absolute truth. We, we live amongst people who don't believe that there are absolutes. We, we see that in people's character. We see that in people's morality or lack thereof. You could turn on the news and you see in people that we put in office that there are times when it is up for debate on whether or not they need to live by the same standards. Anyone in leadership that you look at and people who need to live their lives by the same standard, by the same absolutes. In our culture, most people believe that there is no absolute truth. Hey, que sera, sera, whatever may be, may be. You do what you want, and I'll do what I want. What I do makes me feel good, and what you do makes you feel good, so we can just live in harmony. We can live in perfect unity. There's another bumper sticker that maybe you've seen. We'll put the picture up on the screen. It, it, it says, coexist, and, and maybe you've seen this before. You You've seen people driving uh, down the road in their car. And, and when I think about this bumper sticker, I, I think about particular cars. I mean, people who drive with this bumper sticker on their car, their cars are very eco-friendly. I mean, they're very, they're very clean burning. They're, you know, hybrids for sure. You can put this on a Prius. You can put this on any kind of hybrid. You could put, you can't almost can't put this on a crew cab dually diesel f-250 i mean it almost seems like we okay listen that we draw the line at that you and me the prius and the diesel we can't coexist together because like like bro you're killing my ozone man like this is ridiculous here how can we coexist like that we won't be coexisting for long with people like you and it's like we look at this and we see this and this has become we've become numb to this stuff let me tell you what this, what this bumper sticker means. Because maybe, maybe you've seen it and you just think that it means uh, beatnik or, or hippie or oh, this, this is what it means. The C stands for Islam. The O stands for pacifism. That's the person, that, oh, bro, we hate war and we, can't, we don't want to think about the fact. Let's just all, can't we all just get along? Can't we all just be nice? This is at all odds necessary. We don't want to have any conflict. That's what the O stands for pacifism. The E stands for gay rights. The X stands for Judaism. The I stands for paganism. And, and listen, that may sound like occultic, but there is a lot of paganism in our culture. Can I tell you that many of you are participating in pagan rituals and rites and you don't even know it. Some of you call it exercise. Some of you call it whatever it is you want to call it. There is a new uh, modern paganism that has infected our culture. The S stands for Taoism, or if you turn it sideways like some of the bumper stickers, it stands for Buddhism. And there is a new push for Buddhism in our culture where many, many new Buddhists that they're called would claim that Jesus and Buddha were brothers. They were the same, one and the same. Many people who would say that Jesus and Buddha are reincarnations of one another. The T finally stands for for Christianity. And all of these people would say, can't we just get along? Can't, aren't we just one big melting pot? And don't all roads really lead to heaven? I mean, I know some Buddhist people, and there are Buddhist people who are more Jesus people than Jesus people. I know some Tao people. They're very Jesus-like people, except they're not really Jesus people. But they, they represent Jesus more than like like Jesus people and and there is there is no absolute truth in our culture so to say that that Jesus is God that's very offensive there's a recent article that was about a, a company that started a new phone line and the the phone line is a prayer line for atheists and and when you call the number no one answers the phone and <laughs> and there's no voicemail, the phone just rings and rings and rings and it will ring for all of eternity. And this is real, like it sounds funny, but that's what people think about when they think about prayer. When I pray, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, we, we think that it just goes up there somewhere and it floats around and whatever God gets to it first, that's the God who may or may not answer it. We live in this huge, vast world with 
seven billion people on the planet, and as massive as the earth is, the earth has become so small. Our world has become so small and so connected, and so because of that, we've become inundated with other religions, and we've become infected by other thoughts and other belief systems, and things that used to be odd or used to be taboo have become completely mainstream. Can I tell you, as unpopular as it may be in our culture today, there is one fact that remains, that there is only one God. And that God is Jesus. And the Bible declares that Jesus is God. John chapter 1, verse 1 through 14, that's what it says. In the beginning was the Word. Now pause. You know that I love like the original language and I love to dig in and see what what the Bible really says. And the Bible, we know the Bible wasn't written in English. It was translated into English. And so the New Testament was written in Greek. And, and so the Greek word for beginning, do you know what it means? It means beginning. That's it. There's no other meaning for it. In the start, from the start of all things. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that was life was the light of all mankind. Jump down to John 1.14. It says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace And truth in the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the flesh was Jesus. The Bible declares that Jesus is God, but not only does the Bible declare that, while Jesus was on this earth in human form, he made some claims himself. Here's the first claim that Jesus made. Jesus undeniably claimed himself to be God. John chapter 10, verse 30 says, I and the Father are one. Jesus claimed to be God. And this is the thing that pushed the religious leaders of his day over the edge. This is the thing that caused them to put him on trial. And we read about that process in Matthew chapter 26, verse 59 through 64. It says the chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death. But they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and one declared. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. The high priest stood up and said to Jesus, aren't you going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, From now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. And the religious leaders lost their mind. One version says that they tore their cloak off of their body. They were were so, I've never been that angry. I gotta rip my clothes off. I'm so, how mad do you have to be to rip your clothes off? That's insane. I mean, I picture him. Jesus, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Like he's the like Bruce Banner in the Incredible Hulk and his shoes would bust off. And you are God. And they put him on trial and they charged him with blasphemy, claiming to be God. Can I tell you that Jesus went to the cross for the claim that he was God. Jesus claimed to be God. Here's the second claim. And the second claim is what pushes a ton of people over the edge today. Here's what it is. Jesus claimed to be the only way. Here's the deal. So, so you've probably heard the story. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And right after Jesus washes the disciples' feet, he then spends some time comforting his disciples about the fact that he's going to die and he's going to leave. He's telling them that the reason he's leaving is so that he can go away to heaven and make a place for them. I'm, I'm going to make a place. I'm going to make a way. And one of his disciples, Thomas, stands up and he says, wait a minute. How's all this going down? What, what, what's the way? We don't even know where you're going. How are we going to know how to get there? And in John chapter 14, Jesus answered, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you'll know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Now, our culture would read that or they'd listen to our stance that Jesus is the only way 
And they'd say, oh, that's pretty. The only way? The o- of all the ways. There are hundreds of ways. I mean, if you're in Hinduism, there are thousands of gods. And, and this is it of all of 7.2 billion people on the planet. Every one of them has to go through that keyhole called Jesus. That's pretty narrow-minded, is it? Yes. You read people tell you that you're narrow-minded? Oh, you're a believer. Oh, you're a Christian. Oh, you're one of those people. You're pretty narrow-minded, aren't you? Like, your God is better than our God. And Jesus had a response to that. When people would say that Jesus is narrow-minded, here's what Jesus would say. Yep. Yes. Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I am narrow-minded. Absolutely. No. Guilty as charged. He says it in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Jesus admits that he's narrow-minded. He says, enter through the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus is incredibly narrow-minded, and Jesus is the only way Because Jesus is God. And he requires that we recognize that fact too. In Matthew, I mean in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 through 29, Jesus asks a question. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others, one of the prophets. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? What about you, Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And he asked that question not just of Peter, not just of the other disciples. He asked that question of you today. Who do you say that he is? Because he's either God or he's not. There is no middle ground. If he's not God, we're wasting our time. If he's not God, we're wasting our life. You could have been in bed today. You could have gone to the lake today. You could have done anything today. But come and sit in this room if he's not God. In his legendary book called Mere Christianity, author C.S. Lewis declared that Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. Here's what he said. I'm trying to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That's the one thing we mustn't say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg, or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make a choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He didn't even intend to. Jesus is God. In the 1800s, there was a brilliant man, Dr. Simon Greenleaf. Simon Greenleaf was an attorney, and him and one other man were pivotal in the formation of Harvard Law School. Dr. Greenleaf was considered the world's leading authority on the evaluation of criminal evidence. After painstaking dissection conducted according to what's called the law of evidence, Dr. Greenleaf made this declaration. There is more evidence of the historical fact of Jesus' resurrection than any other event in the history of the world. Jesus, the risen king, is God. Not a God. God. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 declares this. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so people would look at us, thinking that we're narrow-minded, and would ask the question, what is the difference between your God and my God? 
what's the difference between your God, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and all the other God? What makes you so right and everyone else so wrong? It really boils down to one word, experience, experience. God, capital G, O-D, will allow us, me and you, to have an experience with him. And, and no other religion can claim that. Many other religions don't even know who their God is. Many other religions uh, worship an idea or an ideal where we worship a man, a person, who we have the ability to have both a relationship and an experience with. And so I'm going to leave you today with four things that Jesus allows us to experience. Four things that Jesus allows us to experience. Number one is Jesus allows us to experience his power. His power. Uh, John chapter 9 tells a great story. I think it's great. It's one of my favorites because there's sarcasm involved in it. I like any, I like any, that's my kind of humor. My kind of humor, I'm not really a slapstick guy, but I love sarcasm. Even though Sonny tells me that sarcasm is a form of abuse, I say, oh, whatever. You know, so... (laughs) Okay, abuse. That's so, anyway. (laughs) I love sarcasm. And this story uh, has sarcasm in it. And maybe you've heard it before. It's a story where Jesus heals a man that was born blind, and and which is a unique characteristic. He wasn't uh, nearsighted. He didn't, like, get foggy eyes. He was born blind. He never saw. His eyeball never developed. He wouldn't have had a retina properly or a cornea or all of the different things. He would have just had emptiness. In his eyes. And so Jesus, in his way of healing him, he, he chooses a rather unique way in this story. The Bible says that he spits on the ground and he makes mud and he palms it together and he rubs the mud on his eyes and, and he is miraculously healed. And, and when people who knew him, people who had seen him, he was a regular fixture probably on the side of the road as a beggar, when they saw that he now saw, they began to ask questions. Anytime you become different, people will begin to gather to ask why and to ask how. And so the guy's healed and people come around and they want to know how. And when he told them that it was Jesus, it caused them to begin to follow the rule of things. And the rule of things then was anytime that someone was healed, they had to be brought to the religious leaders so that the religious leaders could verify and validate the fact that they had been genuinely Healed, And so they bring the blind man before Jesus and the religious leaders analyze him. They determine that from his claims and from the claims of other witnesses, he once was blind, but now he sees. And so they begin to ask him questions like, when were you healed? And when they discovered that Jesus healed him on the Sabbath, it breaks off for them. See, these guys have been looking for a reason to kill Jesus. They hate Jesus. Jesus is upsetting the apple cart. Jesus is making it difficult for them to lie, cheat, and steal and to rob people with their fake and false religion. So they want to paint a picture of him as a sinner or as a false prophet. So they turn to the blind man for support. John 9, 17. Then they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The blind man replied, He's a prophet. Not getting the answer that they wanted, the Bible says that the religious leaders took other grounds to try to prove that the, that the miracle was fake, that they wanted to prove that the miracle was false. They tried, to, they tried to literally paint a picture that the miracle was a setup, that this guy was a stand-in, that he wasn't really the blind guy. Like maybe they had the cartel throw this guy in the trunk of a car and he's in Mexico somewhere right now. And this isn't really the blind guy. He's just a guy who looks like a blind guy. And he went to Chicago and they put stitches in his face and he looks like the blind guy, but he's not really the blind guy. And so the religious leaders, they say, here's what we'll do. Get his parents and we'll bring his parents in. His parents will look at him. They'll prove that it's not him and so they bring the parents and they say want you to look at this guy I mean really look at him and tell us is this real really is this really your son and if so remember remember he might look like your son remember your son was blind this guy's not blind he's probably not your son he's probably not really your son but if he's really your son how do you explain that that he was healed so the parents go well hmm As for him being our son, yeah, he's our son, for sure. He's our son. 
Got it, got it. Been our son his whole life. Looks just like him. He's, he's our son. Uh, as for his eyes, why don't you ask him? He's a grown man. He, he's a grown up. He can make, he, 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 we know that he was blind, but he could talk. He always been able to talk. He, he's a talker. So you ask him, he's a grown up, he can answer you for himself. And so they turn to him a second time. But when they ask him the question, have you ever been asked a leading question? They ask him like a leading question. They say, okay, you were, how were you healed? But just know, listen, when, when you give your answer, you better, this, the Bible says this, give glory to God by telling the truth because we know this guy's a sinner. Go. <laughs> and in John 25 The blind man gives the best answer ever. This is awesome. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind. Now I see. (laughs) Sinner, I don't even care. Whatever. Came here blind. Now I see. Is that the testimony that you're looking for? And that's you. That's the story of you, and that's the story of me. I I used to be a cheater, and I used to be a liar, and I used to be an adulterer or a drunk or a drug addict or a thief, a manipulator, and I don't know about all the other stuff. I don't know. Listen, I haven't even read the whole thing. I read Proverbs because there's 30 of them, and they said if you read, you know, one a day, I got one scripture memorized. Jesus wept. That's, I don't know, nothing else, but here's what I know. I used to cheat on my wife, now I don't cheat on my wife. I used to cheat on my taxes, now I don't cheat on my taxes, and there's only one thing that changed, Jesus. You know, there is no greater evidence than a life that's been changed. And you may not know everything. You may not have read all the words in this book, but you don't have to know everything because one thing you do know is, is that the only thing that changed is Jesus. And when you submit to his power, just watch and see what he can do for you. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of of the earth, you will be witnesses. Your very life and the change will be witnesses. And the word that's used here that's translated into power doesn't talk about a right or a permission. The word comes from the word dunamis. It's where we get the translation for the word dynamite. The word power in Acts 1-8 talks about an explosive power. It talks about a miraculous power that if you'll submit yourself to Jesus, you can experience a miraculous explosive power that can change everything about you that everyone will see. Number two, he gives us the ability to experience his presence. There is no substitute for the presence of God. You can't describe it, but you can feel it. That's what we depend on here. We depend 100% at this church on the presence of God. Because if God doesn't show up, we're in trouble. If God doesn't show up, we're just trying to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. But 1 Corinthians 14, 24 and 25 says, but if an unbeliever or inquirer comes in while everyone is prophesying, that means speaking life, They are convicted of sin and are brought under judgment as the secrets of their hearts are laid bare. So they will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. There will be an undeniable presence that will cause people to give their hearts to Jesus. And we've been seeing it over and over again for the past 15 months. And people have been coming up to us and saying, i got to bring my friends because there's just, there's just something different here. And they can't explain it, but they can experience it. And I believe they're describing the presence of God. I experienced it for the first time in my life in a locker room when I heard the words to John 3.16. And I felt the power of God fall upon my life. Moses himself talked about it in Exodus 33.15 and 16. He says, then Moses said to him, he's talking to God, don't send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me from your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? What will distinguish you from that person who believes that? What will distinguish you from everybody else in the world is the presence of God. And before you go to work, before you go to school, before you have that meeting, have that conversation, make that decision, pray that you will experience the presence of God. Three, 
God will allow you to experience his peace. His peace. God never promised that life would be easy. In fact, if you've lived life, you know that to be true. Remember how I told you that in John chapter 14, Jesus was comforting his disciples? Well, in John 14, 1, Jesus says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe in me also. Then down in chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Jesus says this because he knows that it's his disciples. They're about to go through some stuff. And he knows that you're going to go through some stuff either. Will, will life be easy? No. But when you're in Jesus, there will be peace. Peace that Pastor Brian talked about. And that peace comes through prayer. You have a tough decision to make? Pray. Are you in the midst of strife in your life? Pray. Fighting with your spouse? Stop and pray. Can you imagine if one of you just started praying in the middle of the fight? You'd ruin a perfectly good fight, wouldn't it? <laughs> you could be cussing somebody. You dirty, rotten, blankety, blank, blank. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. <laughs> Boy, it's tough to cuss somebody out when they're saying the Lord's Prayer, isn't it? When they're praying for you. Dear Jesus, I pray that peace will come on her. You know, just don't do that to your mom because that will not work. That'll send her over the top on that quick but but can you imagine if you made prayer the practice of your life how much you would experience peace Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 pastor Brian talked about it don't worry about anything but what do you pray about everything tell God what you need and thank him for all he's done then you'll experience God's peace which exceeds anything we can understand his peace will guard our hearts and minds as we live in Christ Jesus. Second Peter 1, 2, and 3 says, Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and his goodness. But do you know him? Do you know Jesus? Today, you may be in here and you say, I know him, but I'm not experiencing his power. I'm not experiencing his presence. I'm not experiencing his peace. And the reason for that is because you can only experience those things once you've, number four, experienced his salvation, his saving grace. You know, can I tell you that salvation in our culture has really been misrepresented? That in our culture, we would say that salvation is a prayer. Or its words but can I tell you that that salvation is a life that's been changed a life that has been surrendered have you experienced his his salvation if you haven't you can today because Romans 10 9 says if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved it's that easy one thing believe in your heart confess with your mouth and surrender your life to him you will be saved the question is will you do that today